Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. It's five. Um, so today we're gonna go over intrusion detection system firewall. Um, just to get a little bit deeper understanding on the types of firewall, and then to um look at security appliances and their functionality, so that way you can understand how to perform pen testing and be able to be more stealth. Um using techniques that will evade security appliances. Um, and then we will get into honeypots, okay? So in the on the notes, you can find that it started out with intrusion detection system. And so these are just alarm systems that you would see in the network. Um, a lot of the times you would see IDS being installed inside the, the private network because they are really good at detecting internal threats. Um, and, you know, we would use IPS on the border or the boundary of the network, but you would have network-based and host-based intrusion detection system. So the network-based, it examined the traffic. It looks for patterns that would match what's defined in the rules or that it would see as threats. Um, and then it would sound off the alarm or send alerts. The benefit of this is that you do have a centralized detection mechanism. It is good for defensive. Um, however, once it's already inside your network, that means that you already been targeted. So ideally we would use IDS with IPS. So IPS will block. So unlike the IPS, the intrusion detection system doesn't block, it only detects. For the host base intrusion detection system that will be on that specific system, it's good for um, looking at threats from system logs, integrity of your files. Um, if someone is jeopardizing that specific system, it doesn't have to be a computer um, or a laptop or an endpoint device, it could be a server it could be for database. So host base, often that you would see them as hardware, I mean, as software, but sometimes they do come as hardware. So the disadvantage of this is it does require a lot more resource um, compared to what you would see compared to the network base. So in the first part of our assignment, it asks you to, for the first question, it asks you to describe the function and the objective of intrusion detection system. So the IDS, its job is to monitor, analyzes network traffic to detect and generate alert based on anomalies. Things that are not in the normal baseline type of activity. It could be suspicious events or actions or malicious activities. And so from this standpoint, we would say that it is a network-based intrusion detection system. So for the host-based system, it would do the same thing, but looking at logs instead of network traffic, looking at system activities, processes, right, files and files integrity. So ultimately all security appliance boils down to fulfilling confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Hello. So the network-based IDS, it, want, it will ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability for the network. Making sure that objects or systems are confidential, meaning that we want to protect against unauthorized access, right? Making sure that files and storage has integrity, meaning that we 
we want to make sure that files are not being modified or corrupted or deleted, um, and then making sure that our systems are available. But ultimately, it is an alarm system for the host or the network. So in comparison with the host base, right, the, the question number two, it asks you, how do network-based IDS detect suspicious activity on the network? And how do the host-based IDS detect the malicious activities? So the network base examine the header. So I'm talking about packet header traffic in the network, payload of the packets to detect any anomalies or no or known attack patterns on the network system. So when it looks at the, the header and the payload, it's going to compare that to what was defined as anomalies or, or threats. And we would use it in line with the routers, the switches, the servers, and the firewall. So if you're looking at an actual hardware appliance, we would connect the system to the routers, the backbone switches, right, with the critical servers, and also near the firewall. Because the firewall would filter. It is normally the gatekeeper to the network, so it would check and making sure that certain things are followed. If it's violation of the policy, it's gonna kick us out that out and it's gonna pass through the thing. So if the firewall doesn't pick up that thread, hopefully, right, with the right definitions and, and policy, the IDS will be able to detect it. So that's the whole goal in your intrusion detection system is to make sure that even if that threat gets inside, from the firewall, then we would be able to detect it and then do something about that, right? For the host base, it analyzes the logs, the file integrity, and the user activity. So we focus on more on the system itself compared to the network. And it would use the information from the logs, the file uh, attributes, and the processes for the user activities to be able to identify unauthorized access. So when we're looking at someone is brute forcing a password on the system, we would know that through the attempts, right? Event viewer for Windows and for your, your syslogs and things like that from the other type of systems. Now, if they're using additional tools that is considered malicious, if those tools are somehow being installed on that system or being executed on that system, we would see that through logs and events because those tools need processes and storage. So your system track all of that. So the IDS, so when you're using your security software on your laptop or your home computer, that has an IDS functionality, right? It would notify you if you have a threat on your system, if you are, you know, there's potential things that would harm your system, or when you're using unsafe browsing, right? It's a form of an IDS where it notifies you that you're visiting an unsafe site. So some of that mechanism is built into your browser as well. So when we're looking at the benefits and the disadvantage of the network intrusion detection systems from the network base. So we would use network intrusion detection system in the network so that way we can manage it centrally, right? We can manage the activities and the, the monitoring and the detection in a centralized location. It can detect attacks that bypass perimeters, such as firewall. So if you have insider threats that's already stemmed from within, so the IDS job is going to be able to tell you that there is an insider threat. 
And in the case that if the other security appliances or system doesn't pick it up, then we would be able to hopefully use the IDS effectively, right? We are always overlapping security appliances. So that way, you know, if it can't detect it from the outside coming in, then it will be able to detect it from the inside and possibly control that. The drawback of this is the, the inability to see encrypted traffic. So if an attacker is using encrypted traffic, then the IDS will not be able to detect that type of traffic. Remember that it's looking at the packet, but if the packet is somehow fragmented or, um, or encrypted, it won't be able to interpret the header accurately, right? It also depends on whether you're looking at signature-based or heuristic-based type of appliance. So if it is signature-based, then it's just by the definition of a certain threat. But it's if it's heuristic, then it's going to examine it based on the activities, the processes, all the execution that's involved. Um, so, you know, how advanced is it is also a factor. So just keep in mind that most of the encrypted traffic, the NIDS won't be able to detect that, right? So it's just a monitoring system. And if it's in the trusted network segment, sometimes that can also be an area that's overlooked is because the system already established trust, so it doesn't always examine that closely. And you don't have to put verbatim, we can summarize it, but I want you to have a better understanding of what these systems do. Um, you might have an all-in-one system. They, you know, a lot of the times we would buy a box that would have all of these features and functionality and we would configure it. The downside about that is it is gonna be single point failure. So if they target that box, um, if they, perform an attack on that box, that box is then gonna fall down and you know it's open sesame. So we tend to have many boxes and we would have dedicated roles for certain box. So you would have network intrusion detection system on the inside, multiple, um, and they are built as sensors. So you would see that there will be some that's gonna be operating near your critical switches and routers. And then they would place some in, you know, in between segments that you would see. So it's like having a home alarm system, right? We don't just have it at the front door or at the back door. We want to have sensors on the windows and possibly inside. So in the case, if someone has gotten inside the home, um, it would still activate it. So we want to make sure that we have that kind of layout. Um, and the approach is to really overlay some of these appliances. Now, if we're looking at benefits and the disadvantage of the host base, so we know that the host is gonna really examine the activities um, of the system that it is installed on or it's connected to. So it is able to detect attack on that system. So in the case that if you, you have critical servers and you're using host base, um, intrusion detection system, whether it's application or an appliance, it's able to see the, the attack for that system. And if you have inside the threats potential users or malicious users, you would see if they are logged on to that system or using that system, you would see. So it is its scope is really for that particular host. So when you see this, you see this with um, using host base on like application server, looking at, you know, monitoring the type of applications. And yes, we can use firewall with it, but intrusion detection system, unlike the firewall, it doesn't filter, it's just, it's a way of examining or analyzing, monitoring. The firewall, it filters, right? It blocks or allow based on the rules that are set. 
And the drawback of this is that just like what we've seen with um, network base, so when you have network intrusion detection system, network based type of appliances, you do have um, congestion. So let's think about that. If we're if we have five lanes freeway, all the cars are driving really fast, but we would put a police checkpoint in a location and we want everybody to merge into two lanes. And those two lanes are gonna be where the police is gonna check every single car. Well, in that case, you do have congestion because now the traffic is gonna funnel down to those two lanes. So when you force things to be passed by an appliance, when you have a, a, a need for high bandwidth, you have to do load balancing. That means that we would have many monitoring system and we would divert traffic and we would prioritize the traffic, meaning that certain IDS would monitor specific type of traffic compared to like web traffic. Like if we are an e-commerce company or a streaming media company, we would have certain functionality in the appliances to monitor a certain type of traffic. So that way you're not pulling all the traffic into only a few ideas, you would want to kind of spread that out. And so it does require bandwidth and in the whole space, it does draw resources from your processor, from storage. And because it is live and it's constantly monitoring, so it's gonna pull the resources from the system. And why do we care to really think about this is because in the long run, you have to scale. You have to really think about, you know, the, the activities that are happening in your system or on your network, because if you grow tremendously, those resources will be then consumed higher. And if you don't have the proper resources, then your system will fall down and then your network will fall down. So, um, a lot of the times, you know, operating at baseline might be a model for some business, but it doesn't really scale. And so in that way, you know, if an attacker would know that, then they would target the critical system that, you know, just to, if it, if you operate at the minimum and you don't have plans, then likely that you are going to, you're going to get shut down. So any question? So leaving this class and having knowledge from CIS 27, um, we all should be able to distinguish the difference between network-based, host-based, IDS, and IPS. Just know that the intrusion prevention system, it blocks and allow, right? It's able to reject certain requests from a certain system um, where the IDS simply is just an alarm system it monitors, it overlooks, right? Like having a camera outside and see all the car passes by and it does examine each car. So with that, we would then have to determine based on the scenario on the type of IDS that we would be, it would be suitable. So for question A, it says that if the attacker is performing distributed denial of service, attack by flooding the network with large volume of requests. And the the alarm system that's gonna sound off, that would be the network intrusion detection system. Because when they perform distributed denial of service, we did a lab last week, we saw that, right? It's gonna either capitalize on TCP or UDP traffic by flooding, right? So if I'm flooding, I'm flooding the network and we don't have a specific target. They could have many targets, but in the case that if it is one target, like one server or one system, then it would just submit the request. So that obviously is the network intrusion detection system. So last week when we did the lab, right, there were questions on why did we perform the attack and our servers didn't go down. Right, our web server was still up. It's only a Windows 10 with a four core, right? And about eight gig of RAM. Well, it's because you gave it more juice. 
right? You gave it the amount of RAM and the processor. There's a huge difference between having four core and eight gig of RAM compared to two gig of RAM and one core. So when, when you're targeting a system that has limited resources, they are quicker to go down, right? So what they would do is they would examine the target that they're addressing, right? If, if they're attacking a target that has limited resources, they already know the type of tools and the amount of effort that they will put into that. So if you want to try, you can lower your resource and then try, try the attack again. And definitely you see that it will slow it down or shut it down. An authorized user gains access to critical application server of the company and exploits its vulnerability. And the detecting system should pick that up is the whole space. Because it tells you here that a user gained access to a critical server. So if we have a host based intrusion detection system, it should be able to send the alert. For C, an attacker gains access to an enterprise network. The key there is enterprise network by by bypassing the firewalls and compromises the authentication server to escalate privilege. It should be both. Um, in my opinion, right, because there's two area to this. The the one of the target is the enterprise network and they're bypassing the firewall. If they're bypassing the firewall, the detection system that should pick it up is the network intrusion detection system. But they're compromising the authentication server. So after they get through the network, it becomes a single target here. So if we have a whole space intrusion detection system on that authentication server, then we'll be able to pick it up, even if they bypass it through the network, right? So you would you would use both. What does the system look like? Is it what like a, it looks like. Um, very similar to what you see at the switcher, the routers in the back. So, um, they are, you know, they would have cable connection. They would have, so inside it, you would have RAM processor, a, a chipset board, very similar to your computer. Some system would have more advanced things to it. Some of them would have more storage than others. So the um, hardware? Yeah, so an appliance is, you know, security appliance is very similar to all your other network appliances. But on the the application side, most of them will have certain type of operating system a lot of the time yeah. embedded Linux. Sometimes they would have graphical user interface or menus that you can click. Most of them do now. Um and some can range from, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars and some can go up to 400, 500,000 or more. Security appliances are very pricey depending on the feature that you, the capability. So for something that's in a very large data center like Amazon data center, those appliances are more costly because they are they come with a lot of resources. Just like how you would think about, you know, a, a certain truck. There's a certain truck that's more luxurious and have more feature and towing capability mm -hmm. compared to uh, a smaller pickup truck that doesn't hold a lot that would just do okay with just carrying smaller sure. cargos. Right. Yeah, so you would see them varying in price because of the feature and the capability. Okay. And then for number five, it asks you the 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 scenario is the disgruntled employee attempts to delete critical companies file and corrupted the financial system. This should have been picked up by the whole space because the, of the financial system, okay? So how can an attacker evade the IDS, right? And once you understand the process and, and the functionality of the IDS, it's a lot easier to really see how they can get around it. So evading security appliance is just to make sure that the security appliance doesn't see um, or ignore or be able to bypass it, 
Um, so go under the radar, not be able to be monitored. How can we go about doing that? So for a network intrusion detection system, we know that it is looking at packets, it is looking at protocol, it is looking at payloads. So a way that we can evade as a pen tester or ethical hacker you would see that fragmentation is used. I think we learned a little bit of this when we talked about the knob service attack, right? So how they can break it up into multiple pieces. So let's think about like, if you need to ship an item, right? Like a bicycle to your friend. I'm gonna use that same example before, right? We can ship it as a whole bike or we can break it up into smaller pieces, okay? And sometimes those smaller pieces are harder to recognize what that data really means, okay? So if I'm sending like a light from the bike, you would not know that it is for a bicycle or not, right? Until you have more pieces like, you know, maybe a handlebar, pedal, um, or other things. So fragmentation is simply splitting up the payloads into smaller fragments and making it more challenging for the IDS to analyze and detect malicious content. So if the IDS job is to examine the packets and say, oh, that's malicious traffic, that's the not of service attack, that is you know, a SQL injection. Well, then if we piece it up into smaller chunks, that doesn't make sense and it cannot put it together on what kind of attack that is, it's a lot easier to bypass. So fragmentation is often being used. So simply using the tool to, to make your payloads a different size. Um, so fragmentation sometimes would have you modify your packets. So using tools to modify your packets and changing your packets. So Instead of one packet with, let's say, a certain size payload, we can make that packet smaller with a different size payload. They also do IP address spoofing because IDS examined the, the, the packet header and the packet header contain where it's coming from, where it's going to, uh, you know, payload information and so on. And using encrypted traffic, it's a lot harder to examine those things. Okay, so another area that you would see is the exploitation of the protocol. This tends to be the chosen area for many things in attacks, in evading monitoring system or security systems. So we know that TCP IP is what we use now. There's no way around that, right? Everything in the world use TCP IP suite. IP address is used to determine which system is sending and which system is receiving. TCP is used in transport, in session, in presentation, in application, in you name it, right? Most of the OSI layers, we see TCP. Starting from layer three and up, from routing and up. So as soon as it leaves your network or it's coming to your network, you know, that it has to be under the TCP IP suite, right? Because without IP, you cannot route. Without TCP, you cannot transport, okay? So in order to have communication, we need TCP IP. So to evade at the protocol level, they simply do IP spoofing, meaning that I would mask my address, just like how my home address is, right? Um, I would use a fake address or something that would belong to your network. So that's a way that you can do protocol level invasion. Now, this can also mean that we can, they can also look at vulnerabilities in certain protocol like SSL. Okay, that's with session. So if, if, you want to capitalize on session, you look into the weakness of SSL, the version of SSL they're using. Um, or you can look into transport protocol. It really depends on the objective of your attack. 
So to be well versed in pen testing and in attacks, right, we have to be informed and knowledgeable in protocols area, right? Not just to use the tools because the tools is ineffective if you don't know how to apply it then, right? So I'm gonna harp about this again. OSI layer is gonna be your best, best friend. Yeah. Must know. So the third area that you would see is obfuscation. This is a way to hide or make content not visible. Modifying content or structure of your payloads and make it not detectable. For example, encrypting it, making something plain text not readable to the system. So if something is hard to interpret or analyze, then it's not going to be seen. Using encoding techniques. Encoding techniques. So encoding is a way that we can apply number systems or a certain type of system to translate it to something else. Like you would see ASCII, that's an encoding system. UTF-8, that's an encoding system for text, right? Just how it would be able to interpret it to mean something to something else. So obfuscation simply is a way to make the system confuse. Right? Making it more challenging to really see what it actually is. So if I'm an attacker, you know how they embed things into, you know, um, polymorphic malware, things like that. That's a form of obfuscation is to put things into something that's not visible, that's difficult to detect, that's not, can be, cannot be found quickly. So how you write code? Yeah, depend, yes, that's one way, is to make your code um, more difficult to interpret, basically, to the regular system or to the detecting system. And you see a lot of this in malware, right? Like especially polymorphic malware because polymorphic is always changing. That means that it changes on its own. A lot of the worms, you you often also have that nature because it, it, it is changing as soon as it gets to the system. So the environment, when it adapts to the environment, it's going to change with the environment. And that's the way the code is written. Okay, so it's harder to detect polymorphic malware compared to your typical virus or other type of malware. Okay, so how, how can they evade a signature-based or a behavior-based system? And it comes down to these three, right? Um, by encrypting the code, we saw some of that in the last section, by changing the malicious code structure, because by the signature, signature simply is a definition that's given to the system saying that this is good or bad, right? The characteristic of the code, the structure of the code, this is what it means. Sometimes how functions are executed and so on. Another way is to inject code into legitimate files and code. So that's obfuscation, right? When you insert that into normal files or files that would not be detectable, is then you are hiding it. You're making it confusing. So that's injecting code is another form of that. And then they can also package or compress the code. So when you when you compress file, you changing the file header. Right? When you use an application to decompress your Kali Linux download, simply you tell the system that we would unpack it by changing the nature of the file to a different size. And with that, it updates the file header. Right? And that file header is used for examining by a lot of these type of applications or systems. So compressing it changes the nature or how that file is being monitored or examined. So it's it's harder to detect. And that's how they can make it unrecognizable to the IDS. 
by compression, by encryption, by code injection, by changing code structure. What's another solution to address this? Uh, oh, like reverse engineering, you mean? Yeah. yeah. A lot of the times, yes, you have to re reverse engineer the compiler. Like the um, there are systems that that would. So the the more I think the more false positive system, they would have more heuristic based behavior. So what it is is it's defined that if it doesn't fall under the scope, it becomes anomaly. Um, now the harder part is how you maintain that, right? Anomalies, yeah, anomalies only mean, it's only effective if you if you dynamically maintain it. That means that, you know, how, how when you're blocking websites and things, you have to keep blocking the bad websites because new bad websites are born every day, right? because new servers and servers are changing all the time. Are we gonna be able to block, they say what, 10% out of the 10 million, right? So your your list have to dynamically grow with that. And the same thing with security appliance maintenance is you cannot just set it and forget it. It's not one of those things that you can just be done with. It has to be continuous and it has, and because the machine is instructed to do certain things, but because Everything is evolving so quickly in security, you have to evolve with it and you have to teach your machine to evolve with it. I think now when we start incorporating AI, I think it is closing the gap a little bit with it, but until AI reaches more higher, higher accuracy, you know, because AI is created by developers. And so it only predicts based on the algorithm of prediction. So, um, but yeah, you do see some of that in involvement. It's interesting though, right? Um, and they spend a lot of R and D uh resources on this. So, okay. So how can you manipulate traffic and, and when you evade IDS? We already talked about fragmentation, breaking up the and encrypting the packets. So changing your payload into different sizes and then have them more like more so if my the size is 52 right we want to chunk that up into smaller and group them uh, by altering he packet headers so there are many tools um, some of the tools are known as packet stuffer right you will find many uh, linux based tool that's available you would mask source or destination IP addresses. And this is done in a lot of the attacks already. So we would use tool to change uh, our mass IP addresses. And then looking at what's allowed on that network. We know that ports, so I can simply do a what? An Nmap scan or a scan of your network and I can tell what ports are, are used, right? What protocols are used. So I would use the protocols that you currently using because I know those ports are open and just capitalize on the weaknesses of those protocols. We can also redirect traffic to different routes by modifying the route tables. Now, most routers in the network use dynamic tables. That means that when it routes, it just adds or subtracts. So for example, we have a stale route, meaning that certain system doesn't use that route again. It's kind of like, you know, how you drive home, you always drive home different ways. Every time you drive home in a different ways, you add it to your list. That's a dynamic route. Different routes get added all the time for, from different systems. And then you have the static route where it would be the same way home every day, back and forth, right? It's the same route all the time. Now, in a static route table, it doesn't change very much. But in a dynamic route, we can add new routes to it. So if they have access to that. And for routers, if you guys have, have taken Cisco or network-based classes, you just have to know the secret to the routers, aka passphrase. 
aka keys, right? So if I have access to your key, I have access to your configurable router. I know that all routers are either connected two ways, right? Most administrator would go in or technician would go in with SSH. Or, right, they don't really use Telnet anymore, but sometimes they do, right? So if I can I can either capture that session or pretend to be you or get access as you, get your keys, I can modify your routing table, okay? And routers use specific protocol. So, you know, looking at how we can redirect traffic, um, we learned a little bit about this when we talked about denial of services in the in the past, right? Uh, distributed denial of service is a flood of traffic coming in, possibly from all these different sources, but it's targeting that system. Well, how how can we evade that is to make the system not know that you're sending a lot of traffic to that single target, but send it through multiple target and then that target. So I can route it to different segment that would have router and making sure that it still gets sent to that target. So evading the security appliance, making sure that if you know, if you're well-versed in this area, redirection, you just have to know the network topology well. And how can I know well? I just ping your system, I connect, and I, I scan your system. Running things like packet sniffer would tell me what kind of appliances you have. And then you know, it would also measure the hops, how many hops. So whenever that you see the hop, that's just a router away. So if you have 12 hops away, I know that, oh, okay. So there are 12 routers in between. It's kind of like when you search Google map and it tells you, oh, you have to take five freeways to get there, right? You got to connect to the five and then the 101, blah, 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 right? The hops are like that. How far are you from that network? So if I'm 12 hops away, then I have to kind of redirect my ways to it, okay? You see the importance of networking now? <laughs> the world built on networking, so any question? Okay, um, so it goes into details about all of these things that we talked about for signature-based evasion, traffic manipulation, so an example of this, you do see things like DNS poisoning. Why DNS poisoning becomes prevalent? Because web servers and web servers use DNS. So DNS poisoning is a way for redirection. I don't need to access your router to route your table, to modify your table. The DNS is a way. So you guys ever visit a website and it has a redirection, like that website's no longer exists and it sends you to another URL? right, automatically, you don't need to like click on it or anything. Yeah, that's a form of redirection. So I just update the DNS record. When they reach this IP address, it means this URL, right? That's a way that you can do traffic redirection as well, is to poison the record, the A record. Any question regarding intrusion detection system? We're going to switch gear and we're going to talk about firewall. I want to make sure. So I was like, well, I can gloss over firewall and tell you some of the main ones, or I can give you a deep dive into firewall. I really feel like it will benefit you in the long run if you understand the differences in the firewall, firewall right? A lot of these theories, I hope that you would revisit and understand and try to, to grasp it a little bit more. So the mainstream firewall that you're going to see quite a bit is going to be the packet firewall. Firewall Packet filtering firewall is commonly used. Is it effective? Not 100%. No security appliances is effective. It would do its job for a certain thing, right? So how is a packet fire, fire, fire filtering firewall used in the network? How does it filter malicious traffic? How can packet filtering firewall be evaded by the attackers. So it is placed between the exterior and the interior router. You're gonna have the router, that's your gateway to your private network, right? That's where the firewall is normally placed. It is what we call the gatekeeper. 
Okay, normally that would be considered your border firewall. So its job is to inspect all the traffic coming in and out, drop, you know, drop the traffic that doesn't match its definition or access list, and then allow the ones that's supposed to come in. Kind of like border patrol to the country. Mm -hmm. That's you can say that, right? And you would have segment that would require interior router. Why? Well, we have voice over IP. Okay. Those systems require, they, they are on different segments. Or whenever that you have different segment with different IP addresses for isolation purposes, for, you know, network design can be many different reasons. You need to place some kind of firewall there. Normally you would find packet filtering there. Because anytime that you, the router, the router is just a, a system that will get you from one network to another, right? So when you, when you use firewall, you want to inspect what's coming into your network, what's leaving your network. That's the point of the firewall is to block or allow to. So it's able to do that. So it inspects IP addresses because it looks at packet information. It inspects packet type, right? Could be UDP packet or TCP packet. It inspects the port number. And you see this on Windows Firewall. If you ever try to set your Windows Firewall, you can put down, you know, where that, the you want to block the things on a, from a certain system, right? You ever block phone numbers, the same thing, right? A caller from a certain number. So from a certain IP address, a packet type, port number, and certain protocol. So if I want to block ping, I just block ICMP. No one can ping me. Anytime that someone ping me, the firewall is going to shut it down, right? Kick it back, reject, send it back. So in that case, when I ping, I won't get any reply, and then it's going to bounce back from the firewall. The attacker can spoof packets when they evade the firewall. By changing, when we talked about this earlier, the packet information, payload, IP addresses. So that way it would pass through the firewall. So as a pen tester or an ethical hacker, if you're doing blind testing, that means you don't know anything about their network or their system. You're just going to go in and try to find out like a normal attacker. You have to get your way through the firewall, okay? So you're coming in from the outside and they, you know, like what Mr. Helen was telling me before, my friend asked me to see if I can take down the, the website, the web server where it's hosted, right? You don't know what they have securing their web server, right? You don't. So that's called blindside testing. So double blind is you don't know, you can't get any information. So you have to kind of find, so you should suspect that there is a firewall, whether it is host-based or network-based, expect that, right? There are ways, so the tools that I'm gonna introduce you to today, they're not 100% effective, but there are tools that can help us find firewall, okay? You have any questions? Okay, so they need to modify the packets and the information. So you would see a diagram like this. So here's the attacker. And when we operate as a pen tester, we're going to come in as an attacker, right? So you know that there will be exterior router that's going to route traffic in and then as it routes in it's going to have to go through a gatekeeper which is your firewall and that firewall is going to determine whether that traffic is good or not if it is a good type of traffic it's going to pass it to interior router to get it to where it's supposed to go right 
So the firewall is kind of like the, the pit stop where it inspects all the cars that were coming by, mm -hmm. right? Your border patrol. So likely that you would see that. Um, there are a lot of different type of advantages to some of these firewall. You often see that we would have, have a mix of different firewalls being used in the network environment. So it is fast and convenient, very cheap because it's very popular. I think it's really supply and demand, but its functionality is limited, okay? Um, the disadvantage of this is that you can bypass it. It doesn't have a lot of logging information. So if you're looking for incident, you might not find a lot of details with it. Um, and then you have to do dynamic port allocation to maintain its state. So. You know, there's some configuring limitations or difficulty with that. Okay. It cannot inspect packets from the exterior means. So it's not able to block a certain payloads that are spoofed. So that's how you can bypass it. So with that, you see two categories, the dynamic packet filtering and the static packet filtering. So dynamic is exactly what it means. It is flexible. It's able to transfer a protocol for the allocated ports or port range. And it this is how it is fast and convenient. For the static, they have to manually set the rules. And as I mentioned this to Jose earlier, our security appliance is only effective as we are. So if we are effective and dynamic in setting the rules and having the rules grow with us, then it is effective, right? So for packet filtering that is static, it is ideal for the smaller networks, the you know, uh, small type of business, that doesn't have a lot of changes um, and supporting a mixed type of environment for the infrastructure. Then you have the stateless and stateful. So with that, I'm gonna bring down nine so you can see. So when should dynamic and static packet filtering firewalls be used? Dynamic filtering firewall should be used in handling transfer protocols that allocated ports dynamically to enhance application security. So when you are running a lot of web applications that relies on protocols for transport, you would use dynamic packet filtering if you have to use packet filtering. Most company goes for next generation now because it has mixed feature. We'll talk about that later. For the static packet filtering, firewall should be used in the smaller networks environment that has consistent traffic pattern. Because you the rules update might be challenging for the static. It's we don't update the rules that often. So if you have consistent traffic pattern, then we would use static packet filtering firewall. Any question? So if you are studying for, you know, a lot of like the security certification or even the networking certifications, specific vendor, Palo Alto, Cisco, uh, even Microsoft, you have to know the specific firewall for a lot of the security certifications. Security Plus, they do ask about packet filtering, different types of firewall. Uh, but for the industry, it's it's good to really understand the differences, the functionality, what they do, right? And then if you want to practice, um, you know, Packet Tracer has some models in there that you can use. There are a lot of simulator that you can use to be able to configure them.
And then you can also use software version like Sonic Wall and other type of products. Okay, so for 11, it says, why are stateful packet filtering firewalls more secure than stateless packet filtering firewall? Hi. So the stateful packet filtering firewall, it uses a record to maintain active connection. And based on the record, it would then determine whether that connection should be allowed or not. So based on the state of connectivity, it would then determine whether to filter malicious traffic pattern. So with that, you do see that stateful does require responses and examination of the state, which require resource, right? Whereas stateless packet filtering firewalls cannot detect patterns of malicious traffic like, like denial of service or distributed denial of service that could indicate a sophisticated attack since they do not examine past or future packets. So stateless only examine the current packet that arrives, right? It doesn't have record of what was sent previously or what's coming. Whereas stateful, it maintains that. So it would revert back to what was sent from that system before, right? To really determine whether it's malicious or not. So you have records of it with the stateful. And with that requires storage, right? And then process. So whenever that you see stateful firewall, that just means that it keeps record of what it had examined in the past, the current, and possibly also in queue, which is the future. I pull a lot of the resources from the actual vendors like Palo Alto, Cisco, uh, you know, because your book does give you some general information. Most textbook, it will say, oh, you know, these are the type of firewall. It doesn't go in depth in the advantages. But when you when you work, when you see the stuff from vendor, they really want you to understand so that way you can make the proper decision in buying the type of firewalls and the appliances that you need. Question. Okay, so now we understand the difference between stateful and stateless. Dynamic and static for packet filtering. Packet filtering take a big chunk because, you know, they are very common. Any question? So stateful and stateless you can find that on the bottom of four going into five. And then next best thing, you see a lot of proxy. So proxy sometimes get lumped up into one, right? But you have to know that proxy servers are not firewalls. They can function as filter. So proxy firewalls, there are different areas. So this is, uh, this is commonly used in many companies and many organizations. I see a lot of it in school district because they have a need for it. So it not normally is going to be the in between the users and the trusted network. You often see proxy being implemented for remote access um, or logging into the, you know, a lot of the remote workers, they have to go through proxy firewall. This is a different way to really filter things outside of using packet filtering because we saw the weakness in packet filtering. It works well as a gatekeeper to the internal network, so remote access, and it examined the traffic coming in, similar to packet filtering. 
it works best with the application layer, the highest layer in the OSI in handling traffic that is application related. So you often see proxy is being used in parallel with web application firewall, WAF, W-A-F. Now they can implement many proxy uh, firewall or a few. It really depends on the network layout and what they're using it for. The cool thing about them for proxies is it does anonymize internal network and it does really well with keeping private information private, meaning the, your user authentication, your internal IP addresses because net network address translation convert that to public IP and it has to maintain a record of it somehow. So proxy can shield a lot of that. So it is harder for the attacker to determine your internal IP addresses so that way they can spoof it, okay? It is ideal for web-based services and access. Um, so you often see this is implemented with application servers, with web application servers, um, or even in some DMZ area. It does cache content um, so that way it can quickly revert back to it. So e-commerce websites. Um, now, why do they put it there? Because it's a good way to use proxy and WAF to prevent attacks like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, URL injections. Those things come back to the firewall because the rules that you set on these firewalls are what's blocking and denying or allowing. So for e-commerce, these are useful because they store, they cache some of the information so that way it can quickly be retrieved through caching. Or even if you're using like uh, HTTP forwarder, stuff like that, that would be useful with the proxy firewall. Okay, so with some of that, we can answer the next, oh, I still, I still have some packet information. Okay, so, so um, in comparison to packet filtering firewall, why is proxy firewall more secure in filtering application-based activity? And what type, and what type of network environment should we use proxy firewall? So it does filter, but it filters really well on content which is your data. And along with anonymizing, and it does randomization with that, right, uh, for authentication. So that way, you know, you can't just scan your network traffic and be able to get username and password information, right? You don't want that. So we want to use a firewall to shield that, to protect user access information. Proxy firewalls are often implemented in complex enterprise environment. Most of the time they have infrastructure. You have a mix, different critical sets of servers where your data control is, is used for data exchange. So we would have, you know, inbound, outbound data, data in motion, data being exchanged through transactions or you know, database systems and so on. So you would see proxy firewalls being implemented, but keep in mind that it operates at application layer well. This is what it's for. There's some firewall that's for specific layer. They're designed for specific layer. So proxy is for application. So all firewalls, really they intercept, right? They screen based on what's being passed through them. So you would then need to, um, you know, focus on the type of firewall that would be best for a certain purpose. We can use a mix of different firewall. Just keep in mind that 
you know, they scream. So if you sending 5,000 packets through at some point in time, right, you might have congestion. So the downside in that, you know, these these things would cause bad bandwidth issues in the long run. So we have to, you know, diversify and have more of your screening systems and then do quality of service. And then the next question is, is what type of proxy firewall are you used in the front of one or more web servers intercepting requests from the internet and for load balancing or web acceleration? So if your company is web oriented, e-commerce based, uh, or even streaming media, most a lot of the companies in tech are, right? But if you're looking at like Amazon, uh, Google YouTube, things like that, or even social media, you would then see reverse proxy firewalls being implemented because they do have caching mechanism. So web front, reverse proxy. So when you're investigating incidents, firewall is a good source for you to go because they track everything that's coming in, out, leaving access in your network environment. And for IP privacy, these are the type of proxies that you can use. Non-transparent, these should be really easy to remember because this is exactly what they imply. Privacy means non-transparent, anonymous, or distorting. <laughs> this one. They have transparent proxy and non-transparent proxy, and I'll, I'll touch back on transparent but you can also see anonymous proxy firewall. So it just keep your private IP, private network IP private. Okay, so it doesn't disclose uh, the address translation between public and private. And then distorting proxy, it just randomizes it so it doesn't so it, it uses like a, a false IP address when it discloses it. So you don't really have the actual IP address because attackers, they will interrogate this firewall. So when I say interrogation of firewall, they just look at the logs or scan it or be able to examine it, right? They analyze it to get the information when they do recon. Any questions? Okay, so we can look at some of the advantages and the disadvantages. I think we touch on most of these. Um, and with this, you would see that you know, in some cases, it cache, that cache data can also be exposed. So we got to make sure that we have encryption um, for our data and where the, the, the information is stored as well. So a lot of the companies that I've seen uh, use forward proxy firewall. This is very common. This is a way that you can um, get some of the user access to the internet. It does screen, so basically it passes the traffic onward, right? Hence the name forward proxy. So it would take, so let's say that you're here at RCCD and you're trying to access something at, on the internet. We can screen that with the forward proxy. So your request would go to the forward proxy and it can 
take that and forward it or reject it. Um, school district uses this quite a bit. I've seen some kids actually bypass board proxy. Um, they're pretty clever. But so let's say that if you the kids are accessing non-allowable website, the forward proxy would just kick it back, right? They won't be able to load the web page. Um, but if it's allowed, then it just sends it forward to the web server. You can also see reverse proxy. This is, we already talked about this for web server. So both of these, they actually cache the information. So if I've been successful forwarded to the web server that I'm trying to access, if I visit it again, it, it doesn't take as long, right? So the whole point is to streamline with the proxy in the long run. There's um, transparent, also known as inline. So it would require a special configuration, um, but the user will not know that this exists. So if you want that hidden in your network from the user standpoint, then you would use the you would use the transparent. And then the non-transparent, we already talked about this, but it does IP masking and content filtering. So the IP that it shows to the world is not the, the actual IP that you have. And then anonymous, it hides the IP address. Elite proxy, this is less common, but it does act as a forwarder. Um, and then the distortion. So the next part is the stateful inspection. So here's the diagram. You know that whenever you see the term stateful, you know now that it uses the state table, right? It keeps track of connectivity, established session. So it inspect. So normally these guys are also at the border. And it is better than your packet filter or your circuit um, because, you know, it requires more of a state for inspection. So it does require more resource. So it looks at the active connection in the sessions that are established. Okay. So for 15, it says, how are stateful inspection firewalls different from packet filtering? It requires more network resources than compared to packet filtering. They are also higher in price. Um, they're able to pre detect and prevent exploitation on established connection using dynamic connection state from the table. So it has a record of the session and the connection state. Similar to what you see with stateful packet inspection, but better. It is the next level up. Because the packet filtering, uh, the stateful packet filtering, it's only examining the packet for the state compared to stateful inspection firewall, it does have the session and the connection information for, to, to make that decision. So in the, you know, ultimately the decision is more dynamic it is more intuitive compared to your packet filter. Question? No. Almost there. I know this is a longer one, but want to make sure you understand the difference. The challenge though, I'm going to let you know that using software-based firewall, I mean, the functionality is still there. Um, you know, compared to an appliance, it's not the best. I've been trying to purchase the actual firewall appliances. I do have security appliances that act like a firewall, 
Um, but as you know, if you search for firewall, they're not exactly really cheap. Right, I'm talking. talking about. So if you look, I mean, the cheapest one you've seen is a few thousand dollars, right? Um, but if you're looking at, you know, next generation and things like that will be expensive. So, well, hopefully down the line, we'll be able to have budget to buy variation of firewall. So when the students go through the program, but packet tracer is also ideal for you. If you want to look at some Cisco technology and how to configure them, really good to learn how to configure them. Even the legacy ones. So when I was in the field uh, as a network administrator, Cisco picks were very, very popular, right? They retired those a long time ago. Now they have different ones. Okay, you can find all of this information in this section for the firewall, just condense it. Okay. Let me put this down 15 to the next page. So um, circuit level gateways is traditionally been there for a long time. Um, before we refer to gateway as routers, but firewall can also be gateways because you have to use them to pass traffic in and out. So you would see circuit level gateway, they are similar to firewalls, but they they act, they, their functionality is slightly different. They don't really inspect packets um, compared to packet filtering. Packet filtering really look at the packets coming through. Those are like the post office inspector that looks at all the pieces of mail and the packets, right? That's a packet filtering firewall. Circuit gateway is really ensuring that their the sessions are legitimate and the packets are known to the connection. So it only, it looks at the session state. So it works in the session layer. compared to packet filtering firewall. Yeah, I don't like it when I see something and they said the general firewall. There's so many different type and functionality in the firewall. When people just lump up and say the general firewall, it's like, what do you mean? Like, what kind of firewall is it, right? So likely that you would see the basic firewalls, the packet filtering firewall. You would see this in your uh, host-based firewall for your Windows. If you configure your Windows um, firewall, which I normally do for my CS27 class, you would see that we block by IP, right? We block by ports and we block by protocol. That's a packet filtering firewall. <laughs> so it's built on that technology, that foundation. Okay, so one of the cooler ones that are, the, that's the new kid on the block, right, is your next generation firewall. This has been around for a while, but I think it's one of the newer technology. It's different than your traditional firewall, like stateful inspection. It does look at the packets, but it builds threat intelligence, meaning that it's pulling from threat databases all the vulnerabilities and it feeds it into the the decision making process on which type of traffic is harmful it does adapt to the flow of applications so it does well in many areas compared to stateful inspection So that means that it has a hybrid feature, packet and stateful combined. It has a thing called DPI, which is known as deep packet inspection. 
where it doesn't only look at the packet header, but it looks at the data itself. So some firewall operates, like I said before, circuit level gateways does the session layer. We saw that proxy does well with the layer seven, which is application. NGFW or next generation firewall does well from layer two to layer seven, from data link all the way to application. So this is the thing to get nowadays. But with that, the configuration is a little bit more difficult, right? But they're making a graphical user interface and set, but you can also use the command line interface, the the terminal with it for many of the models. And there's different tier too, right? So if you're getting an enterprise next generation firewall, the scale size is also different. And you can find it can be very expensive depending also on the vendor, the feature that's incorporated, management capability, scalability, and so on. We love boxes and security. <laughs> different function for each box. So you can say that it's more of like an all-in-one, not, yeah, mostly, mostly all. Multifunctional firewall is the next generation firewall. They didn't want to call it multifunctional. I think that's a cool name that they gave it, next generation firewall. So now we know the difference. Any questions? Depends. If it's depending on the firewall, we just went over this. The type of firewall that your your target is is gonna determine your tool. If it's packet filtering, then I can spoof. Right. If it's stateful, depends. If it's static or dynamic. So you have to really see what your target is. Right, just like boxing, you don't want to go to a ring and not measure up to who your opponent's going to be. You have to make sure that you know, right? So that way you know their weaknesses. Same thing in security. Okay. So with cloud technology being incorporated in every organization, you do see that there are cloud tools. Um. If you look, AWS, um, Azure, Google, they all have incorporation or tools that incorporate it with their cloud packages, software, or even appliance. So cloud-based firewall solutions, you see them sell this. Um, ultimately, you're using a third-party provider, Amazon or Azure, and that means that you're restricted to their legal requirements, um, also their resources. So your customization option is gonna be limited as well. If the providers fail to deliver what the security function would be, then your system could be, or your critical system could be compromised. So you're reliant on their responsibility in security. So make sure that if you do purchase option like this or your company does, you got to make sure that you're looking at your agreements and your MOU. So if there, there's also functionality with the virtual firewall. So if there is limitation or issues with the virtual firewall, then you would you would have problems, right? So you basically you're tied to their service, their appliances, and the appliance features. 
And it also have different tiers. So if your requirements is high, your payments or your costs would be high. But the maintenance behind it is not 100% yours. So you do shift the liability to the cloud company or the service provider. Many of the security service company, they revert to this. Um, it's a way for them to you know, cut costs along with having the customer protected in a sense. So you don't have to buy an appliance. They don't have to buy an appliance. They just use an appliance that's already exists in the data center for cloud um, and then configure that or use a software tool for the virtual firewall. So ultimately, what are the things to do? If you need to evade firewalls, you can hide your traffic by using a VPN, encrypted connections, right? IPsec or tunneling, right? Tun actually, IPsec has tunnel, but you can use encrypted traffic and VPN offers that. So if you encrypt the connection between your system and the remote servers, masking the device IP address, it will bypass the firewall. So going back to the question earlier, well, how can I bypass the general firewall? Use encrypted traffic, mask IP. You can also use proxy server. And remember, we talked about proxy does really well with keeping the IP address is private, so we can use it to the advantage of evasion. The attacker can do the same thing. If we can hide the private IP, the private network IP addresses, they can also hide the original IP addresses. So if you're blocking based on IP address, that's not effective, right? Because they might use proxy. So to do that, they would be able to get into the network because it cannot detect malicious IP. And VPN technology also offers tunneling like IPSEC, or you can use a tunnel-based mechanism which encapsulate your data packets. It adds the tunnel header, so the protocols will bypass. So if you're blocking based on protocol, tunneling will get them through. So we can evade the same way, right, to use tunneling. So data encapsulation is very common. You see this with your smartphone. You see this with all your system, but it's just a way that we treat the packets or the communication so that it's it sees it as something else, okay? So knowing that when you configure the firewall, you cannot rely on blocking by protocol IP addresses, right? We have to look at like the state of connection, the sessions, all of these other areas. So if you're using next generation, it has the proxy capability as well, okay? Um, but like I said, if you're using only one form of technology, that's also a downfall. <laughs> so, 
Um, for example, if I stick with next generation firewall and if they know the model and the type, then they would just focus on those areas and they would still get into my network. Okay. So like I said, if if you if you already know like the strength and the weakness of a certain system, it's a lot easier to target. Okay. Evading firewall. Something to highlight, as I mentioned earlier, right? SSH is used to connect to these appliances. You can directly connect to configure them. And, um, but it also can be used to bypass because it uses encryption. So whenever that you generate a session for secure shell, it requires a key. Um, so this creates an encrypt tunnel between the device and the connected system. And you can use this to redirect some of the traffic from an attacker standpoint, whether you are doing ethically or unethically, right? So if we use it to our advantage, they can also use it to their advantage. So the exploitation, a lot of the times the downfall is this, the rules. We have to continuously maintain the rules um, for growth and also improvement. Lack of updates and patches on the actual appliance firmware is a big area for a lot of the security appliance. Um, and then human error in the configuration. So Honeypots is a decoy system to lure attacker in. We use this for study purposes to understand what they're attacking and how they're attacking. So the production honeypots is deployed on the network. These are going to be, you know, basically deflect attacks in real time. It simulates services and applications. So it looks like a server or, you know, some type of system, but it's not real. The research is a standalone system and it's used to gather information. It has high interactions. So the more data you feed it, the more information you get. They do mimic the real system more closely and they would have a lot of services. So how can you know it is a honeypot or not, right? A lot of the time the characteristics will come through. So when you scan a system, right? As an ethical hacker or pen tester, just sometime you need to assume that they are honeypot, right? If A lot of the time, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true in my book. So um, so that's important to, to understand. So the category of honeypots that provide high interaction, that mimic real system, that provide a wide range of services and functionality, and it is wide open, then it is likely a research honeypot. <laughs> the type of honeypots that attempt to lure malicious servers, um, to lure in malicious servers, that the attackers use while hacking clients, those are called client honeypots. These honeypots are normally on a virtual network environment or the virtual environment. So virtual machines um, or even containers and then virtual network, so on VLANs. Can they spread? Sure. However, um, it is containable. That means that we can control it. So they would pose as clients to observe on how the attacker makes a modification to a server during the attack. So we use this information, we use this information to close the security gap or improve our security measures.
So honeypot is a form of deception. So whenever, just like how we talk about pretext is phishing, <laughs> right? Phishing falls under pretext because you have to convince them to do something that's not real. But um, so deception includes honeypot. And so some of the, the common deception techniques is to give misleading information. Have false signal, false vulnerabilities. All of these are fake, right? Mm -hmm. False credential. In my book, if things are obvious, likely that they are false. So if you scan and you see, you know, executive passwords, you should ask yourself, is it false? <laughs> is this a honeypot? Um, yeah. So to effectively de deceive attacker in the network, a lot of the times we would implement honeypot, but with that, right, uh, if you read, about honeypot, a lot of time people are going to give you the warning. I'm going to do the same thing. If you implement honeypot, just make sure that you prepare for the worst and you are well versed in configuring your security systems. Because if they can get to you, then likely they would, they would use the honeypot to launch into other areas. So Sometimes they would implement honey tokens or honey files, and those are just to lure attacker. Tokens are used for access, and you know files are used for applications. So those can be placed in systems to attract a certain type of attacker. So that's also a form of deception. Okay. So I tested like five different honeypot tools. And as you know, they're not that abundant. And I tried to give the students who took my 41A class and taking this class. So, but I had to go back to Pentbox because the other ones are so unreliable. Right, like you go down that rabbit hole, it works on this, and you have to get the other stuff to work to get it to work. So, um, yeah. So the last part of our lab today is gonna be Pentbox. I think some of you already use Pentbox. It's a good resource to kind of learn. Um, okay. Let me stop recording. Some of you are still writing down your answer.